Welcome to another episode of the Zach Hiley Show. Today, I have the honor of being with Dr. Goldberg. So Dr. Goldberg, I'll read over your bio, we'll go over some stats, and then we'll let you talk. Okay, ready, here we go. So Dr. Goldberg is originally from Wilmington, Delaware, where she was valedictorian at Concord High School. She went to UPenn, where she majored in the biological basis of behavior, graduated magna cum laude, and was judged to have the best honors thesis in her major and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. She went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine for her MD degree and was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha. She was a surgery resident here at Jefferson for many years, but changed careers to pathology. We're definitely getting into that, okay. She is currently a cytopathologist and gynecologic surgical pathologist. She is also the doting mother to amazing twins and loving wife to her historian husband. Her research focuses on graduate medical education and laboratory quality and safety. In her spare time, she loves to ski, row, and watch her kids do karate and play baseball. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you for having me. So the way we start is we'll go over some statistics around pathology, and then you tell me if any stand out to you or any are interesting to you. Okay. So the median salary for an academic physician is 339000 with pathology being median of 304000 Average hours is 51 across America, MDs, uh, with 45 hours being for pathology. 59% of physicians across America are happy compared to 62% of pathologists. 47% burnout on average compared to 35% of pathologists who one third for the third least amount of burnout among physician specialties. When asked, would you choose the same career? 41% of physicians across America said they would choose the same career, while 46% of pathologists said they would choose the same career again. Step 2 average score was 246, with 239 being the pathologist average step 2 score. Anything stand out to you? Anything interesting? Anything you want to comment on? Um, I mean, I would say, first of all, I think these statistics sort of make sense. Okay. They're, they're pretty much what I would expect. Um, I think... Uh, I'm not shocked to hear that we make overall less mm -hmm. than certain specialties, yeah. although I think um, uh, thinking about our hourly wage, it's probably just as good, mm -hmm. if not better, than even some of those really high-powered financially uh, areas. Um, you know, and I think beyond the hourly wage is the control over our time. Um, and, you know, I, this is the pathologist ex-surgeon hat on, but, right, I... I have plenty of work to do, but I have a fair bit of control over when I do it. There are obviously certain important timeframes. Turnaround time for testing is important. But if I put my kids to bed and then come back and look at slides, doesn't affect anybody. Obviously, you can't do mm -hmm. that in the operating room. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of uh, value for your time, we're probably getting a better bang for our buck. So not surprised to hear that. And I think that that leads to more happiness, less burnout, you know, a desire to choose the career again. So tell me, what is pathology? Okay, so definitionally, right, it's the study of disease. Yes. Um, so very broadly speaking, pathologists are usually the ones running the laboratories yeah. in hospitals, and we're going to give results, diagnoses, based on specimens removed from patients. Um, we also run blood banks, yep. um, both out of hospitals and within hospitals. Um, forensic pathologists, so like medical examiners, that's us too. Um, and, you know, many pathologists will wear multiple hats, run multiple, be in charge of multiple aspects of the lab, or specify in just one small area. Got it, got it. What are some places you could subspecialize in? Yeah, so... Um, most folks who do residency yeah. uh, become double boarded at the end in anatomic and clinical pathology. That's me. Um, that's most pathologists by far. And that's four years gets you two board certifications. Got it. Most folks then go on to do at least one year fellowship. I, I think see. it's very, very rare not to. And there's um, both fellowships that will give you board certification. I brought the list in yes. case anyone's <laughs> listening. So, Blood banking, yes. also called transfusion medicine, chemistry, clinical informatics, cytopathology, which is what I did, uh, dermatopathology, forensic pathology, hematopathology, medical microbiology, molecular genetic pathology, neuropathology, and pediatric pathology. Wow. So those are all extra board uh -huh. certifications. But a lot of pathologists actually do a fifth year that won't get you another set of boards, but gets you either increased expertise or exposure, probably with some confidence boosting. Uh -huh. 
And that's usually in surgical pathology or one of its organ-based subfields. And this is a fellowship? Correct. And why do pathologists, you said it most do a fellowship. Yeah. Why do most do a fellowship? Well, so historically, the pathology residency used to be five years, where yeah. that fifth year was very focused. Got it, okay. Um, and then I think to improve flexibility, um, that changed to sort of a I see. almost a four plus one model where Got that it. plus one is assumed. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who practices without that fifth yeah. year, but in theory, I mean, absolutely, not in theory, in actuality, you can sit for your AP and CP boards after those four years yeah. of training, and you could go out and practice. Um, it, I think it could be tricky to get a job, at least in academic medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a, a, a silly question, but it's one that just popped into my head. Because when I picture a pathologist, I'm trying to think of the my image of a pathologist in the first year of med school when I didn't actually know what they did. Sure. And I pictured you guys, you know, always in front of a microscope or in front of a computer, just kind of like looking at things, writing things, looking at things, writing things. But do you guys have ex encounters or exposure to patients? Right. So that, that image of sitting at the scope in the yeah. computer is... Um, 100% correct yeah. for certain types of pathologists, yeah. right? So that's what my day uh -huh. mostly looks like. Yep. Um, however, for folks like transfusion medicine, they spend most of their day looking much more like you'd think of a, a clinician, yeah. right? They're they're um, meeting patients who need therapeutic phlebotomy. They're meeting patients who need red cell exchange or phoresis, you know, either um, for sickle cell disease, uh, you know, a range of things. Interact with the patient, decide if the treatment they can offer is appropriate, be in charge of that treatment. Obviously, um, yeah. they have support staff that actually yeah. run the machines, uh -huh. but if the machine <laughs> isn't working correctly, they're going to call the pathologist yeah. to make the machine work better. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a way in which you're a pathologist and they run the blood bank. So obviously that's very lab-based, high yeah. immunology, molecular medicine, but um, they spend a lot of their time with patients and interacting with other clinicians to, to you know, get the right treatment for patients. Yeah. Um, and honestly, cytopathology, um, right? My fellowship year, I did over 200 fine needle aspirations on patients. So, right, that was most days I met at least one patient, if not more, and had a quick interaction mm -hmm. with them, explained what I would do, obtained informed consent, um, performed the procedure, chatted with them and, the, and their uh, clinician, and then went back to my lab. And is this an aspiration anywhere on the body? Is it usually, does it have to be a certain superficiality level? Uh, yeah, or? a great question. So, I am trained to do anything superficial anywhere. So, if I can feel it, I can poke it. Got it, got it. Um, but plenty of places, and, and here, right, so I did fellowship six years ago. Since then, we've started within our department. We have an ultrasound machine. Now our fellows graduate with competency yeah. in doing it ultrasound guided as well. There's different schools of thought as to who is best or, or which different groups all, you know, equally are uh, good options yeah. for performing ultrasound yeah. guided FNAs. But there are certainly institutions in the country where they're done exclusively by cytopathologists. Yeah. Yeah. And the other cool thing about, so I did a pathology rotation for four weeks and I thought it was very cool. I thought it was good really interesting. You. One of my favorite things actually was when um, I was with a doctor and she specialized in kind of GI pathology uh, and I just came off a colorectal surgery. Oh, that's perfect. Thing. And I was in with this doctor and, and one of the surgeons that I actually knew called this doctor and said, listen, we're in the OR right yep, now. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit more about this kind of in-the-moment important yeah, interactions sure, that pathologies sure. have? So this is called a frozen section. Yeah. Um, we currently, um, we sort of split up. So there's five surgical pathologists who are on every week mm -hmm. and we split up the responsibility mm -hmm. throughout the week. We take turn who's, you know, who has the weekend. Yeah. Um, but there is always at Jefferson, a pathologist, a surgical pathologist who's available to read what's called a frozen section. Mm -hmm. So pretty much what happens, um, a specimen is brought down from the operating room. It could be something as large as a PPPD specimen. It could be something tiny as a, you know, very small nerve margin, facial nerve margin, let's say, um, we can slice something up to about the size of a nickel. But obviously, we can make multiple nickel mm -hmm. size slices. Um, we can, you know, so you immediately slice it. You can ink it. So you can say like, this was the true, very true edge. Um, or I want to see distance between the edge and this obvious tumor that I can see grossly. Freeze it cut it on a microtome, stain it. The stain takes about two minutes to perform. All told, um, our regulations say within about 20 minutes, we should go from having the specimen to having the slides. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can, you know, call into the OR and say, 
your shave margin is clear or we can do a, a margin comparing the edge of the tissue with an obvious tumor. You know, you've got five millimeters of clearance. And or, these margins are so important, right? Because in this case, you're dealing with a cancer or a tumor correct. or something well, like that. Well, you know, and we'll also do them for, you know, concern that there could be mucor in the sinuses and you want to start treatment immediately. I mean, there's there's a, a, it's not just oncologic. I see. That's probably the most common. Yeah. Um, but there are other reasons. And the patient is under at this point, right? Correct. They're under. And, you know, I mean, the stakes are are high, right? You want to make the right call because surgery, it's not appropriate to do a frozen section or yeah. section unless surgery is going to depend on the result. Yeah. I think this segues perfectly <laughs> into the next question, with, which is, you were a surgeon. I was a surgeon. And then you changed over to pathology, which is a very interesting change that I wouldn't expect out of anywhere. Can you tell me a little bit about that transition? Because I know it might it must might, must be a big story, and that's what we're here for. Okay. <laughs> so it is a big story, yeah. you know, and I think it's still one, if I'm being honest, one that I'm working through, sort yes. of what okay. are the life lessons for yeah. me. I will say I get tapped a lot to talk to folks who are thinking about surgery and something else. Yeah. So I've had this conversation multiple times. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it probably starts in medical school okay. um, where, if I'm being honest, I loved it all, right? I loved, loved the first two years of med school. I felt like I was this sponge just yeah. getting to soak up so much knowledge. And really every rotation, you know, that third year where you do all these um, sort of everybody does the same OB, internal yeah. surgery, med, uh, surgery, I loved all of them. Um, so it wasn't as if, Surgery was the only place I felt happy. I liked a lot about everything. Um, and I think important to know, right, this is like the end of my third year of medical yeah. school. I didn't recognize that MDs did pathology. Yeah. Um, which, you know, so I couldn't even consider it. Did you it. know what pathology was, though? So I loved my histology okay. course at the start of med school, which yeah. was taught by an amazing PhD. Yeah. So to me, that work was PhD work, and I wasn't mm, getting a PhD. I see. So yeah. I, I didn't even consider it. I see. Um, so, right, what did I love about the OR? I, if I'm being honest, felt a huge sense of satisfaction at the end of a case, right? You had acute appendicitis and now you don't. That's a great mm -hmm. feeling. Um, I felt like the operating room, I looked at it as this almost like temple type place where, um, you know, it was quiet and everybody was focused and really thinking about just one problem. And then that problem got solved, mm -hmm. which I really enjoyed. I have such respect for folks who manage high blood pressure for a living. I didn't find that as satisfying mm -hmm. as that I'm going to meet this patient who has a problem. I loved that interaction part, but then I'm going to put you to sleep. We're going to solve the problem. I'll meet you maybe one or two more times <laughs> to make sure you're healing okay. Yeah. And then we'll both move on with yeah. our lives. That, that was a right feel for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think at that point in my life, um, I was not only happy making my career my primary focus. That's what I wanted to yeah. do, right? There was no thought to, oh, I might want a holiday. That's yeah. okay. Thanksgiving can be for other people, right? I didn't, wow. I, um, I didn't feel like I was giving any uh, that part up because I okay. was gaining so much, I right? I see. So, you're so, it sounds like you're very passionate about surgery at this point. I mean, I still, I, I yeah. did a frozen for Dr. Yo not yeah. that long wow. ago. And I was even thinking to myself, like, I still look at the OR schedule and say, like, that'd be a cool room to operate in. So it's not as if um, I didn't, didn't fall out of love with it, if, I see. if that can yeah, be. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, but I would say, right, so I... I Came into residency with all of that. Uh, was a resident here at Jeff, so did three clinical years. Wow. Um, if I'm being honest, there were some nagging doubts during those three years. Some of the things weren't maybe what I had hoped for. Or things were a little different. Uh, felt like a lot of sort of protocolized, protocolized mm -hmm. medicine mm -hmm. where, right, learn all the steps, do them, done. Yeah. And while I was learning them, that felt exciting. But then once they were part of me, it felt like, well, what's, what's like, what's next? What's what am next? I learning next? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, that's important. You need a framework. Mm -hmm. So some of this is, is probably inappropriate frustration, uh -huh. but it was still frustration. Yes. Um, and then everyone here, or I think almost everyone here goes into the lab for a year yep. after three clinical years. I absolutely loved the lab. So I did mouse model work, flow cytometry mm -hmm. work, all breast cancer models. I had 
a phenomenal year. Wow. I felt like I, that questioning, that like thirst for new learning, that wasn't like something to push in the corner. That mm-hmm. was that was something that like, oh yes, what what questions do you have? Yeah. Let's, let's think through them together. Yeah. Um, I really got excited about that. Really, um, uh, in some ways I felt like I was surrounded by my people. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I've heard this this expression many times from people, and I'm and I, it, it's I'm starting to it's I'm starting to develop certain phrases. Surrounded by people is a is a key thing. Yeah, you know, and I I felt like it was important not to pick a field that had people like me yeah. because that's how we repeat cycles that may not work. Um, so I I think you know for medical student listeners only give this so much credence, but at least give it some credence, right? The, if you're surrounded by your people, it might be because they like similar things to mm-hmm. you, and so you might like this, um, right? So I will say also, that year in the lab, I had a planned pregnancy of surprise twins mm-hmm. that were due, uh, that ended up being born June 30th, my last year in the lab. Um, that was a very hectic transition. I have no idea, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, those nagging doubts that I had, the the sort of alive feeling that I got in the lab pushed me to really give those questions some real thought. Um, personal for my son, so I don't really want to go into more details, but when he was six months, he had a very frightening health scare. He's 100% mm. healthy now, but it was very hear. scary at the time. Um, and it really made me refocus what are my priorities, my whole priorities? And when this happened, you're in surgery? I'm, a, I'm halfway through my fourth year of uh, clinical surgery. Clinical surgery. Yeah. If I can say, I felt incredibly lucky to be supported. Folks said, go take six months mm-hmm. and figure out what makes sense for mm-hmm. you. I talked with really as many people as who would talk with me. Um, a lot of parent doctors, mm-hmm. a lot of twin parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and just sort of said, like, how does your life work, right? Um, what would you have done differently if you were in my position, right? I had about 18 months to go at that point of a surgery residency, and I, I felt confident that I could make it, but not sure if it made sense anymore for who I was as a whole human being. Um, and I really, by luck, one of my co-surgery residents knew one of the pathologists who had this surgery resident. Um, she was now faculty. She had a kid the same age as my twins. This pathologist had a kid the same age. She's like, why don't you just talk to her, hear what it's like. And that conversation was really uh, momentous for me, right? She brought up a lot of sort of familiar moments for me of things that I enjoyed in medical school, things that I enjoyed in the lab. Um, and I heard a lot of echoes from her of things that I thought I loved about surgery that I recognized were not necessarily unique to surgery, right? In some ways, for me, my microscope is my new operating table, Mm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and sort of one thing led to another, um, tons of support from the surgery department here for which I will be forever grateful, Mm -hmm. but I made a change to the pathology department here and completed my training. Wow. So 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 you're six months into your fifth year, your fourth clinical year. Correct. So your fourth clinical year. And then you do you so do you take those six months? I Is did. this during those six months where you're really Correct. figuring things out? I took okay. six months. I continued to put the kids in daycare yeah. and pretty much spent every day. I talked to folks who use their MD to work in industry. Yeah. Like uh-huh. Anything you could use an MD for, if you were willing to talk to me, I was so appreciative yeah. for your time. I would love, were there any other paths that you considered? Did you consider industry? Did you consider? So my dad is a chemist okay. by training yeah. and had worked in the pharmaceutical industry yeah. for a long time. So I talked to some folks there, um, talked to some folks actually at the ECRI Institute who okay. do um, like uh, quality and safety, yeah. which I am like. was <laughs> always incredibly passionate about whether related yeah. to surgery or path yeah. or medicine, you know, whatever. Um, I had a hard time with the idea of leaving patients entirely. Because um, the main decision point is finish the surgery or go into something else, right? That's the main decision point? I mean, so finish surgery or do something else. And then if it's the something else, what? is What, the, what is the something else? Yeah. <laughs> right, is it so, within medicine? So the first decision you're making is to leave surgery, right? What are the salient points or what are the pe- things people tell you to kind of push you in that direction? Or were people saying other things like, this is why you should stay in 
surgery. I'm just curious out of, I want to, if possible, boil down all these amazing conversations that you've had with people and, and kind of see kind of what are the things that stuck with you? What are the things you remember people telling you and like, that's a good point. Hmm. Why didn't I think about that before? Many of them were depressing. Okay. And so I don't know that I want to share that. I mean, if I'm being honest, yeah. most of the women I spoke with told me to run. Really? Which uh, is a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, because of what goes on in the surgery field? I think, so I think, first of all, this was over 10 years ago. Okay. So I'd like to think, and I certainly know here, things yeah. have changed significantly. Yeah. So I would like to think that this advice is no longer appropriate. Okay. But I got a lot of, it's not going to get better. Um, so if you're not happy now, you won't be. Yeah. Um, I got some, and I think this was meant supportively, um, just get 24-hour care until they go to kindergarten, and then you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that was meant as like, Allison, we don't want you to yeah. leave. Like, it was truly meant from a kind place. Yeah. But in some ways, that actually cut me deeper because, right, I'd had twins. We probably weren't going to have any more yeah. after this. So, like, when I missed a first step, I missed all of the first steps for my children yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, which... As twenty, as a twenty-two year old, was like, sure, who cares? Mm -hmm. But now, as a brand new mom, I cared. Yeah, um, yeah. So that didn't feel like a good. No, solution. you don't. You don't. I mean, because what's? I mean, again, I don't have kids. I have no idea possibly what this is like. But I mean, I can imagine that you want to spend some time with your yeah, kids, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not complaining <laughs> yeah. to go out to dinner occasionally yeah. without them. But no, I mean, especially my my kids are great. Yeah, I absolutely adore yeah. them. I. I wanted and I want time mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, no, exactly. So then do you have any of the salient positive points of saying kind of like, what's pulling me towards pathology? I hesitate to take on that lifestyle Got label. It. Got it. Um, I think, you know, I work with some pathologists who work incredibly hard. Yeah. And I would say just as hard as surgeons wow. I work with, in, worked with in terms yeah. of hours. But the flexibility of those hours is key. Got it. Um, and even, right, like my office, I, maybe this is too much information, yeah. but right, like I've signed out cases with a vomiting daughter in my office because mm -hmm. there was no one to take care of her. Mm -hmm. My husband was away for work. Yep. She came in with me. We closed the door. I wore a mask. She puked in the corner. <laughs> Everyone was taking care, right? <laughs> And and it's fine, yeah. right? Like I didn't let any patients down. Yeah. I took care of my daughter. Yep. Um, I can't think of another area in medicine that offers that flexibility. I can't think of that either. Yeah. So that's helpful. Yeah. Um, that's a pull. That's a good pull. That's <laughs> definitely a really good pull. I agree. I agree. So this is so that's crazy. And was do you think there was ever was there ever a moment where it's like listen I just had this phone call I'm doing pathology or was it kind of a slow burn It was a slow burn It was a slow for burn sure. Okay Um it was you know every day that I was away from surgery realizing that like hey I didn't operate today and I'm yeah. okay Yeah. right like I'm not going through some horrible yeah. withdrawal yeah. like I miss it but uh -huh. I'm all right I don't actually need it in yeah. my life so there was that slow burn and then I think sort of every after I spoke with this one pathologist uh, I was introduced to many others, yeah. and every pathologist I spoke with, I got more and more yeah. excited. I heard, you know, lots of echoes of things I enjoy, um, things that I liked from medical school. Yeah. You know, I think I also, I always have had a lot of respect for folks who can admit when they don't know something. Mm -hmm. And I think that is actually the hallmark of a good pathologist mm. is someone who says, you know, I haven't seen this before, but I'm going to figure yeah. it out. Right, yeah. you know, like I, I don't know what this is, and I'm excited to learn. Mm -hmm. That is a good pathologist, and those are always people who have that um, mindset. I've always held in really high regard, so I, I think that was another. I love draw to hear the me. I don't know, especially from the attending and stuff like that. Right. I love to hear that. It's I, like, wait, you can mess up, I can mess up, and you know, I would say it's not even messing up, right? Yeah. It's it's recognizing that the boundaries of medical knowledge move every day, yeah. and that's part of what makes this job so wonderful. Yeah. And right, so I would say that's another pull for pathology is the longevity is yeah. huge, right? How many surgeons did I see not able to operate because their backs gave out? You know, we have we have folks in our department Just in the their 70s, the physical in tolls their 80s. Of being a yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you, 
are dedicated to being a lifelong learner. That yeah. lifelong can really mean yeah. lifelong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and what was the, I'm interested, what was the reaction like of your friends, of your family, mm. of your colleagues? Was anything like, oh, what's going on here? Or was... So interesting. So, um, again, I don't know if this is going to end up feeling too yeah. personal after the fact, but a surgeon dad of twins said to me, I'm so happy that you made that choice. Okay. Like, this was not doable. I'm glad to see you found something else um, that's going to make you happy. Interesting. So that yeah. was a very interesting. Yeah. And he hadn't reached out to me while I was deciding. This was like after mm. the fact. And I was like, where were you five months yeah, ago? Yeah, talk. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Not sure why I didn't think to reach yeah. out to him, honestly. But um, that was interesting. You know, a lot of my close friends, um, I mean, I got a ton of support, yeah. obviously. I think for me, there was this horrible feeling. of right. I had a very close group in med school driven women, um, all went into different fields. They were finishing up or were already in practice yeah. in res, you know, have either finishing up residency or already in practice. And here I was starting over as an intern yeah. again. Um, there were some feelings, honestly, embarrassment mm -hmm. or, or, um, like what's wrong with me mm -hmm. kind of thoughts. Um, definitely got a lot of, I can't believe you're going to be still in training for another yeah. five years. Yeah. Um, which was hard. I was in training for a long time. I don't yeah. recommend this path, <laughs> um, right? It was the path for uh -huh. me without a doubt, yeah. but uh, I don't suggest, you know, five and a half years of surgery and then five years of yeah. pathology. So then, you, so then you're, in, you're, in, you're in the residency. You're yeah. in the pathology residency. What's that like? Is it like, dreams are true. I'm over the rainbow. This is, I'm so, finally here. Honestly, from day one, it yeah. was like clouds had parted. Awesome. Um, you know, there were definite, um, I say growing pains, but right, I came in with three women who I think had known their whole lives they wanted to be pathologists. Yeah. And right, so there were things they knew very well. I hadn't looked, besides mouse tumors, yeah. I hadn't <laughs> looked at histology in 10 years. Wow. So right, when we're looking at, at normal stomach, they were like, oh, there's the parietal cells. And I'm like, wait, which one's, right? <laughs> but yeah. in the gross room or in the morgue, and they're like, oh my God, how do I find the biliary tree? I'm like, I got gotcha, you, yeah. right? So I came in with different skills yeah. than them. So there were some adjustments, I mm -hmm. guess. But overall, I mean, I loved what I did almost every day, wow. which is right going through all these different rotations yeah. in pathology, which is great. I felt like I had colleagues who treated me with respect. Um, you know, nobody, nobody at work was like, why did you switch from surgery? Mm -hmm. In some ways, the opposite. Folks would be like, oh, ex-surgeon, come, yeah. come yeah. look at this. And this is where I'm thinking the margin yeah. is. What do you think? So that felt good. Like, okay, I may be an intern again, but I have some knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then frankly, right again, to speak to the flexibility, a pathologist resident schedule, it's eight to six in the hospital most days, or even less if necessary, um, you have to hit the ground running in terms of reading and studying because you will not see everything clinically that mm -hmm. you need to know for yeah. the boards. But, right, you can study whenever. Nobody cares. And how did you decide to further specialize? Why did you mm. pick um, a cytopathologist and gynecologic surgical pathologist? That's a good question. So... I, I'm not bored. I'm not, um, I mean, you can't be bored in gynecologic uh -huh. surgical pathology. I didn't do any additional training. Yeah. Um, it was an area, so as a, as a pathology resident, much of my research, almost just by luck, ended up being in gynecologic yeah. surge path. Um, there was an interesting project that came up in my second year that I was like, oh, I'd love to be a part of. And of course, you know, lasted through a couple of years, got some publications out of wow. Um it was exciting, and right then you go to national meetings and you get to meet Speak people who do that. Things, right, yeah. exactly. So it it um, lent itself nicely. Um, so cytopathology maybe is a, a bigger question. Why cyto? Um, and there were a couple of reasons. I loved love using my hands. So doing fine needle aspirations was incredibly appealing. Like it felt like, well, that's it. Like if I can put it in an A line, yeah. of course I can get some <laughs> cells out of you. Um, so it felt like using a skill set yeah. I had, maybe making that surgical time less yeah. of, I don't want to say a waste, but, but using those skills. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of it. Um, I also really liked with cytopathology, you get to keep your sort of hands in all the different organ systems, yeah. right? So like here, we're subspecialized. In surge path, 
you sign out GI or ENT or whatever it is. But for cytopath, I sign out whatever comes in. So I felt like that allowed me to keep some breadth of knowledge. Yeah. Um, I also, like I said, most of my research now is based on lab quality and safety. Cytopathology has some of the most stringent guidelines. Mm. And whereas some folks might be turned off by that, I... Why are there such stringent guidelines? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I think some of that is historic. Okay. I'm not sure if you have heard, and I'm going to get some of the details wrong, but in New York in the late 80s, I want to say, there uh -huh. was a sort of scandal in terms of pap smears where mm -hmm. folks weren't given their results, mm -hmm. um, which led to, uh, let's say, enhanced regulations. Mm -hmm. I think also, right, so with, with cytology... You're dealing with a very small amount of tissue, right? When we talk with pap smears, we even say it's we're giving an interpretation, mm. not a diagnosis, um, which you know is like maybe silly wordplay, but does have some meaning. Yeah. It's real, um, and so I think be, perhaps because of the small amount of tissue, um, and maybe because of these, you know, the scandal for whatever reason, there are significantly more guidelines. Mm. So especially in terms of pap smears, yeah, um, and. Like, I love that. So yeah. we, we are required to do cytology histology correlation. So if, if somebody has a fine needle aspiration, say, of their parotid, and I call it a PA, and then two months later they get their parotid removed, and it's it's not a PA, but some high malignant— is, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, okay. A pleomorphic adenoma, Got which it. is a benign yes. neoplasm, but that can uh, have malignant transformation, so should okay. be removed. But if I, you know, if I call it a pleomorphic yeah. adenoma, and then it ends up being some high-grade malignancy, mm. I, I need that feedback. Right, that's important. And so I I review all that uh, correlation yeah. as is required. Yeah, this is another again a side question, but I remember occasionally on certain calls, so on certain slides, they'd be like, "I think it's this," but you have to get other pathologists' feedback. Sure. Why? Why is that? Why is it some slides they're like, "Okay, we can say this is the diagnosis, the big bold lettering." I love to see the way pathologists. <laughs> my favorite thing was seeing the residents type things, mm. and then the, the mm. attending pathologists coming in like, "You know what? Maybe we should do this, <laughs> this, and this." But anyway, so so why do in certain cases you need two attending yep. pathologists? Yep. So a great question. So some of this is. Um, institutional protocol. Okay. Some of it is, um, you know, sort of protocolized across the country. Yeah. Um, so here at Jefferson, uh, in surgical pathology, all first diagnoses of cancer mm. require a second signature. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right, obviously that's a, a life-altering call yeah. to make. Um, and it's, it's a way... You know, I think it's a way for us to continue to calibrate. Like, you know, how how bad do the cells have to look for you to want to call cancer? Mm -hmm. Like, let's all be on the same page at all times. So it's a way to encourage that communication. Mm. It's also, I think, an important nod to the the importance of that diagnosis and what that's going to mean for the patient. Mm. And let's double check ourselves. Double check. So all in surgical pathology, all first malignancies get to. Um, need two faculty members. In cytopathology, and again, because we're dealing with less material, every single malignant diagnosis requires two names. Wow. So, which, again, I love with cytology. I'm like working with my colleagues <laughs> on a regular... Right, right, right. Like working with here. my colleagues with the re you know, on a regular basis. Um, and again, because that call can mean so much yeah. and could be on so little material. Yeah. There are also then, I would say, those cases that are challenging, that are gosh, I really think this is cancer, mm -hmm. but I'm a little hesitant because either the quality of the cells or the quantity or there's an inflammatory background. Maybe these changes are just reactive. Mm. Um, and that's when it's great to show a whole bunch of people with really experienced eyeballs and not because I have to, yeah. but because, you know, you best to. for the patient and I want to and it's good for the department also yeah. to talk things through. How far can we go on this? And this speaks to the importance of, you know, finding a good team of yeah. people and a good residency and a good Absolutely. faculty place wherever you're going to be. So you, so you finished residency and now you're an attending. Now you're an attending. Can you walk me through maybe, and I don't know, are you, are you, do you do, I know you have administrative duties. Do you have like a percentage? So most of us, so it's a little different, I think, than certain other fields. Okay. Right, because we need to cover the services. Mm -hmm. So every week we have, at it, 
Jefferson Center City, we have five or six faculty members who are on Surge Path, yeah. and ideally two faculty members who are on Cytopath. Got it. So you need really ideally eight people on yeah. every week. Yeah. So I think my contract says something like eight to nine weeks a quarter I'm on service. Got it. But realistically, like we had a, a tough year where a bunch of folks had kids and we had a lot of like a maternity leave mm-hmm. and a paternity leave and somebody retired. Yeah. You do the weeks you have to do. Got it, got um, it. So when we're fully staffed, I probably am on service about eight weeks a quarter. Got and it. we do our service work a week at a time. Got it, got it. So let's go through, if you don't mind, an average day of when you're in the hospital. Yeah. Can you tell me when you get in, what do you do, when sure. do you have lunch, all these kind of things. So, all these boring details that I don't no, think are, are boring really, at all. No, that are really, really important. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's that we my don't point. talk about yeah. enough. So I'm going to give you a cyto week yeah, because sure. I do those the most. Great. Um, so I, uh, and I'm going to take you from the beginning of the day. Take Be- me right away. Exactly. When you first open your eyes. You got it. So <laughs> 6.05, the alarm goes yes. off. <laughs> um, and so, it's a sound of music. It's uh, what <laughs> Uh, it's, it's some <laughs> awful noise to get me up. So um, on a cyto week, three days you'll sign out and two days you'll cover rapids, which Got is it. sort of like frozen's a yeah. similar concept. Um, so the days that I'm on rapids, I get up, take a shower, get my kids up. Everybody gets breakfast. I make all the lunches. We're out the door at 730. I get them on, um, take them on the subway, watch them get on uh, at City Hall to head west to middle school. I walk to Jefferson. I'm um, in the office by eight, try to sort of like get myself started, review maybe some things from yesterday that I didn't quite finish. Um, usually rapids start coming around 8.30. I'm pretty much in my office until five. Um, and those days are, are sort of, I don't say catch as catch can, but you never know how they're going to be, Got it. right? Because it depends on on interventional radiologists, yep. depends on our gastroenterologists, mm-hmm. the other folks in yep. the hospital. Um, those days always follow a day on sign out. So any cases that needed additional stains, I'm going to manage that day. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll also be going to my partner in crime for the week and saying, you know, these are things I want to call positive. What do you think? Yep. Um, We also have a fellow. So if any interesting um, PAPs come up or um, like stat cases come up, I'll make sure to show them to him. Um, Eat lunch whenever there's a break. Yeah. Um, uh, I honestly often pack myself like snacks that yeah. day and right wow. like so granola bar uh-huh. here, apple there, whatever. Um, and then five five thirty, I'm going home. Um, this time of year, that means either I'm taking a kid to baseball practice or I'm taking a kid to karate. Right, exactly. Um, and then you know dinner, bed, the, all that. And are you working at home? Almost uh, so. Never on clinical stuff, Got right? It. Can't bring the slides home. Yep. That's very much illegal. Against the law, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I certainly bring it home up here yes. sometimes. Um, occasionally, I will bring, like, if I'm working on a manuscript, I'll bring, like, a manuscript home to do, I'm, like, a pen and paper person. Mm-hmm. So, I'll print it out, do revisions, maybe during karate or at baseball mm-hmm. practice. Got or, it. right, that kind of thing. But for the most part... There's never any... Because my... My thing is because I hear of doctors going home to finish notes. And mm, they, mm, there's mm. nothing that you like, ha- or you're going to get called by admin, like you didn't submit the da da da. No, I mean, so all of my notes, I really should be doing at work Got because it. they should be done while I'm looking at the slides, right? Yeah. So, no. Uh, the only work that I do at home on a regular, on anywhere near a regular basis is either manuscript revisions, if I have a lecture, a new lecture coming mm-hmm. up that I want to finish putting some stuff together for, or like revising one. Um, or um, like committee work for I'm on a committee for the College of American mm-hmm. Pathologists, American uh, Society of Cytopathologists. So maybe some committee work I could be doing in the evenings, but Got not it. not much. Yeah. Um, and then those sign out days are very different, mm. right? So same alarm clock, yep. <laughs> but get the kids up. My husband takes them, so then I row in the morning. Nice. Get which is amazing, yeah. right? And then I get to work at like eight forty five, nice. and that's fine. Yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, start sign out when my slides arrive, which is somewhere between 9, 9.30, mm-hmm. whatever. Sign out usually until 1. Yep. And then I have my afternoons for like admin stuff or meetings or I want to show somebody this complicated case or follow up stuff from yesterday. Yep. Um, and then the afternoon and evening are pretty similar. Yeah. So that's how we're making it, making it go. No. And then, so I should say, I am somewhat unique. I take okay. very little call. Okay. So we... Um, 13 weeks a quarter 
in general, 13 of us take one week per quarter. Okay. So um, I, I do take one yeah. week per quarter. So Friday afternoon through Monday morning, one weekend or four weekends a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe occasional weeknights, uh, but and, not And what lot. is cause? It's just if something needs to be looked at, right? You have to come into the hospital or are you at home? And yeah. you're a certain distance away, these kind of things. Good questions. So... Um, we do have a telepathology setup. Yeah. So for folks who uh, want to, they can use that. Um, I live um, like two thirds of a mile south of the yeah. hospital and never felt as comfortable with that for something as high stakes as a frozen. Mm-hmm. So I come in. Yep. Um, we stay in the hospital until the ORs are are done or the cases obviously wow. won't need fro- yeah. cases obviously won't need frozen, yeah. right? So, you know, if, if they're doing a laryngectomy, the margins are all clear and now they're going to work on reconstruction. I don't need to be I here see. for that. Got it. Okay, right. got it. You don't right. need to wait till they close up or anything exactly. like that. Exactly. Good, good, good. Um, until, until we're confident they don't need us anymore. So, you know, any... Um, working day, like yep. Monday through Friday. I wouldn't go home until I'm confident yes. I'm not needed. And then overnight, it's mostly gift of life mm-hmm. where this organ is, we're not sure if it's usable or not. Can we look at it microscopically yeah. to decide, which like, what a great reason to mm-hmm. come back into yeah. the hospital. Um, and those are not super common. Um, and right, by living close, it makes it relatively makes it easy. more easy. Yeah. Got it, got yeah. it. Okay, I'm going to ask the fun question now. I don't know, I, I know, I don't know if you saw this one, but if I gave you a hundred million oh, dollars I liked that today, question. okay, good. <laughs> if I gave you a hundred million dollars today, tax free, it's in your bank account. You can do with it whatever you want. Do you a continue working full time? B change to work part time. C switch <laughs> careers entirely and become a high jumper or something like this. Or D go live on a beach with your family and quit everything. Yeah. So part time is definitely the answer. Um, I feel like at this point I have. A lot of training, and yes. right, this is I'm finishing up my fifth year on faculty. Yeah. I have some comfort level mm-hmm. that I didn't in the beginning. Also, yeah. I don't want to lose that. I'm like, yeah. this is a cool job. Yeah. I'm genuinely yeah. happy to come to work, and if if full time work yeah. gives me space to enjoy my family, work out, you know, see my friends, then then part time even more. Even so. more of that right. good stuff. Even more. You know, and there stuff. are plenty of pathologists who write rather than working that eight to nine weeks on service a quarter yeah. say I, I want to work four to five and oh. and get half pay or, okay. or that is absolutely a model that I've seen and you can do that you can just go to your administration and I say, mean <laughs> you need right I, I couldn't just tomorrow be yeah. like so next quarter I'm, I'm only now. right right uh, that's a conversation to have yeah. but there are absolutely jobs like that that Got exist it. um and, you know I know people who've gone through that transition so part-time um I think it's enough that you keep your skills. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. that's nice to hear because I've heard I've heard internists as well. I heard one internist who actually only did moonlighting once a week per month, and that was a full time salary doing one week a month of moonlighting. Wow, interesting. Interesting, right? Yeah. But you can also do when you're an attending hospitalist, you do one week on and one week off, which is right. another interesting thing right. too. But those are full weeks. Those yeah. are full weeks. Yeah. Those are full weeks. <laughs> so pathology. Now that you said you do, what do you think? is the best thing, or the best things, it could be multiple things, about being a pathologist. Okay, so I wrote down and, and highlighted some yes. things that I want to yeah, make yeah, sure yeah, I yeah, say. Yeah. Go for it. So, Take to- everyone off of surgery. Let's go to pathology. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we need our surgeons. Yes. <laughs> um, so the number one thing for me is I love that part of the job is to constantly learn new things, Got to it. constantly push boundaries. I think that is exciting. It makes you want to come to work. I like sort of being the doctor's doctor, we say a lot in pathology, right? Mm. In some ways, rather than explaining things to patients, I'm explaining things to my clinical colleagues. I love that interaction, the relationships I get to form, really exciting. I, as you've heard, really um, am passionate about healthcare that is high value and safe. Uh, Being working in the lab allows um, you to sort of keep your hand on a lot of that value and safety aspect Mm -hmm. of healthcare. For my life, the flexibility is phenomenal. And I think the longevity is exciting, right? Seeing folks in my department in their 70s, in their 80s, happy to come to work, absolutely still contributing and helping patients. It's exciting. It, It that sounds really it's good. Nice thing to I see, love that. Yeah. I because I remember I also liked that in the in the, when I did my stint in the in, with the pathologist. I love the calls. You guys get calls from the doctors all oh, the time, yeah. and you're like, 
what do you think this is? Right. You're like, I saw this. This is my clinical correlation. What do you think? The da, 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 da. It's, it's I love those conversations. I like it too. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to and be And that was part my favorite that. thing about surgery, actually, too. My favorite part of being in the OR was, you know, you'd be on a complicated kind of colorectal case and you'd be on a, on a woman and you'd be going kind of close to kind of that gynecological area. And you're like, wait a second, I shouldn't, I don't really know what we're cutting down here. Let's get this other guy in oh, here yeah, to kind yeah, of figure yeah. out what we're really looking at, where the ureter is and all these kind of things that are tough. That was my favorite. I lo- That's probably one of my favorite things about medicine. It's just the collegiality, just the people coming together to help people, right? It's something that you can't really match it with any other career, I don't think. I don't. I mean, I've never had another career, yeah. but I can't yeah. think of another one think where of it's, one. it's so high stakes and so so important to work together. I can't think of it. I can't think of it. So the counterpoint yeah. to, of course, what is the best thing about being a pathologist? Is what is the worst thing about being a pathologist? So I think, and this was my own experience yeah. as a med student, right? Pathology can be forgotten as a field for MDs, Mm -hmm. right? Not at Jefferson, but at some other places I may have interviewed. There may be offices in the basement without windows. That's where the morgue usually Mm -hmm. is. So I think it can be underlooked and Mm -hmm. potentially then undervalued. Mm -hmm. Um, Less glory than some other fields, right? I'm not cracking chests in the EROR as mm-hmm. a pathologist. Um, so there's not that like rush yeah. of adrenaline yeah. and excitement, yeah. which I'm cool with. Yeah. Um, but but for some people, that, that. that drives them. Yeah. And so it's important to recognize not a lot of that. Not a lot of, yeah, bone cracking. Right. <laughs> Unless you're in doing <laughs> right. autism. So uh, plenty of bone cracking, yes. actually, right? Like Not get, emergent bone cracking. Exactly. Yes. I do yes. it very slow and yeah. carefully. Right, yeah. right. That was an interesting thing. The autopsies are a whole nother thing. They're cool, but they're scary too at the same time. Okay, this is whole. I'm yeah, I mean, train. autopsies are, that's a whole a whole conversation. I think, um, Even honestly, being in the anatomy lab for my first time and seeing that if you live in a city for like over 10 years, the bottom of your lungs have those little black dots on them. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, I mean, anthracotic pigment. Yeah. But uh, but it's not damaging to you, right? Or any kind of way? I don't think so. Not that we know. No, I mean- okay. I mean, so we'll the, find out. right? Because <laughs> it depends on what exactly mm-hmm. is within you know your personal yeah. lungs. Um, it's in, it's it really is interesting. To, like the heart, the heart for this is really we're getting real basic here. But I thought you know when I first came into med school, the heart was going to be some massive thing with all these lovely, well defined arteries and veins coming out of it. It's just a junk of red stuff. In my in my initial looking at it, I would argue they're well defined, but maybe that's <laughs> not for the best. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Um, no, I mean I loved doing autopsies. Yeah. I, it felt like very safe yeah. surgery. Um, I right, we all do a month at the medical examiner. Yeah. That was harder for me. Yeah, um, that's a lot of uh, unfortunately mm-hmm. underbelly. Um, I was there just as fentanyl was getting into the drug supply here, so it was a scary time. Mm-hmm. Um, and right, you know, you're seeing. Uh, the unfortunate yeah. side of humanity. Is this the forensic more subspecialty? Okay. Yeah. Did you ever consider that or no? no? So uh, I have so much respect for forensic pathologists and we've actually had a number of residents go into it recently. Yeah. I mean, it's a hugely, right? Those are the folks that are going to sound the alarm that there's fentanyl mm-hmm. in the drug supply now mm-hmm. or, or um, you know, help families, you know, your, your loved one died from a genetic complication. The yeah. whole family should now get evaluated for that genetic complication. Um, Right, so huge public health ramifications and then also sort of personalized medicine yeah. ramifications. Really important stuff. Um, I had a hard time with the underbelly of humanity type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I recognize that you're there sort of to shine a light in the hopes of improving things, um, but I, I, I knew it would get me down on a regular Got it. basis. Got it, That makes sense. That makes sense. Is there anything you wish you knew before becoming a pathologist? Uh, I mean... That it existed. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, right, so I came into the f- the second time. Yes. I came into pathology really as well, uh, well read as possible. I had spoken to so many people at that point. Probably more read than 99% right, of the other right. pathologists going into it. I had met individually with like half of the faculty <laughs> at that point. So I, I think I was pretty well aware. Um, you know, I, I think spending time in the department is what one needs to learn about the field, which is a shame in that many medical schools don't, the medical students just don't have that opportunity at all. You know, certainly not a required 
uh, rotation, and then even on an elective basis can be hard to organize. Yeah, and which is why I'm, I love that you're here talking to me about this because I think it's so important to get exposed. Because I speak to uh, attendings all the time, and a lot of them tell me that they wouldn't have went into their field if they didn't have this X, Y, Z interaction with someone. And a lot of them also say that they stayed away mm. from a certain field because they had an X, Y, Z interaction with someone. So I think it's hugely important to increase the exposure. And this is my thinking. Again, who knows if it's right or not. But I wish med students were exposed to more in their first year. That way they could know that, you know, this is kind of cool. I want to learn more about this or learn more about this. Before you're in third year and you're like, wait a second, I didn't even know this existed. Now I have to figure out my applications, research and all this kind of thing that we think of as as med students that we got to be the most competitive and know the most and all this kind of stuff. No, I agree. I, I wish that earlier on in my medical training, I had um, thought to ask about this, yeah. right? Like, honestly, histology was my first class in medical school. I loved it. I wish I had thought to say, like, wait, are there MDs that yeah. do this? But I didn't know to ask you that just don't question. Think. I did, right. You're in the you're the thing. This is the status quo. They know everyone knows what they're doing, right? And I'm I'm not Jefferson again. Top choice medical school. I'm so happy uh, I, I went mean, there. I love it here. Blah 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 blah. But this is a general thing for medical education. I think I just wish. I, I went outside a little bit. I explored a little bit more. So that's why if you're listening to this podcast, you're the best medical student, you're the best person <laughs> ever because you're getting that exposure. And I should say, I didn't go to medical school here, so yeah. I can't speak to, uh-huh. I, and yeah. But I think it's honestly um, typical of medical schools everywhere. Yeah. Right now, having read thousands at this point of applications of folks applying to pathology yeah. residency, Many of the personal statements are like, oops, stories yeah. of how I found pathology. Um, lots of people come to it late. And I think that's because of the way that the medical education system yeah. is is set up. What is the most common myth about pathologists? <sighs> common myth. Well, I think one of them is you're a pathologist, so you don't see patients. Yeah. Right? Which yeah. is definitively not true unless yeah. you want it to be. Yeah. Um, and I think folks can think of us as sort of introverted, like they just want to be alone with their microscope yeah. or in their lab or whatever. Yeah. Um, most of us are not like that. <laughs> and there's so, there's so much communication, right? There's communication right. not only between your patients, but it seems like there's communi- constant communication between you and the providers. Say for some reason they're in the OR doing a procedure, they're going to call you. Or if they read, this is, this is the more common interaction that I saw, they read something and they're like, really, do you think this? Why do you think this? Tell me why you think this. I didn't know you're a pathologist, but I'm the, 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 the it's right. kind of thing. Um, you know, all of the all of the above. Yeah. I also write and making a lot of phone calls to say, um, this might become as a surprise yeah. to you, but that biopsy you sent us that, you know, it sounded clinically like you were yeah. thinking about X, it's actually Y. Yeah. Right. So I'm picking up the phone to start those interactions yeah. a lot. Um but yeah, we're in I think if you're doing your job well as a pathologist, you are in constant communication with your clinical colleagues yeah. and other pathologists. So you have to enjoy that. So that yeah. that person who literally just wants to be left alone with their microscope may not be happy. Yeah, maybe you do a PhD and right, PhD exactly. that involves no human stuff or something like that. So what do you think are the characteristics, why did I trouble with that word, of someone who would excel in pathology? So I have three, and yes. they've been said, I think, throughout this yes. conversation. The first one is you need to be open-minded. Got it. Right? If you're going into any case saying like, oh, this must be cancer, you're already down the tubes, right? You have to be able to be open-minded. I think you have to love learning and be able to be comfortable not knowing things. Uh, if you're the type of person who wants to be the expert in the room at all times, it might actually not be the field for you um, because how I sign something out today, 10 years from now, we could learn that that actually is incorrect. So I have to live with that for the rest of my life. Everything I type up could end up being wrong down Mm. the road. And those reports and those slides, we have to keep them, Mm -hmm. right? So somebody can say, Allison, 10 years ago, you called it this. We don't call it that anymore, right? So you have to be comfortable with that. Um, And then I think you have to be comfortable talking with your colleagues constantly saying, you know, I'm not sure how far would you go with this? You have to be able to start those conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, right, for my area of pathology, you have to enjoy a day at the microscope, yep. right? Really drilling down on details, thinking through what could this be and and having those thoughts again and again and again and again yeah. all yeah, day yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. If sitting at a microscope for eight hours is unappealing, 
the job of a surgical or cytopathologist is not for you, but there are other fields in pathology that could be. That are definitely for you. So say you're a third-year medical student and you're not really sure about pathology. Maybe you're thinking internal medicine, maybe you're thinking radiology, whatever. How would you advise them to start learning more about pathology or making that decision inside of their head? Because, you know, applications coming up, ERAS is coming up. How do I decide if pathology is the specialty for me as a third-year medical student? So I think the first thing you do is you email me yeah. or Dr. Chan. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you say, I'm considering pathology. Yeah. Can I send, spend some time with the department? Yeah. Right. So in Cyto, we're lucky we have a large multi-headed scope. There is always room for one yeah. more. Always. And we are excited to have folks. So come for the day, which mm -hmm. right in Cyto really means coming from like 930 to 1. Mm -hmm. Sit with us. And you won't necessarily understand what you're looking at, but are the conversations we're having exciting or boring? Mm -hmm. Are you psyched to see what's on the next slide or mm -hmm. are you like enough already? Yeah. That should be very telling, at least in terms of the jobs where you're looking at a microscope yeah. in pathology. Um, so I think that is the best place to start. Dr. Chan and I will always find room for you yeah. to come for a day. <laughs> and then, right, I would say I would really encourage folks to do, at least at Jefferson, yeah. we have a four-week rotation in yeah. pathology that's, you know, open to uh, fourth-year med yeah. students. I would really encourage folks to come for that month. You get exposure to lab medicine as well as as that microscope-type life. Um, so you can you can start seeing, am I excited to come to work or am I bored? And, yeah. And I, I think that's the most telling. And this, and that's really helpful. But I also think it. I wish more people that weren't going into pathology did this pathology rotation because mm. I think it's so helpful. For example, I'm going into internal medicine, but I did a pathology rotation. I did a radiology rotation. I did um, an infectious disease rotation because I just love these kind of things. And it's helped me so much just to see what goes on behind the bold letters of, you know, this is this or this right. is this. It's helped me so much. So I, I think, I mean, Dr. Chan has done a fantastic yeah. job. We definitely get folks coming in, especially in the spring, yeah. saying, I know I'm not going to be a pathologist, but, right, like we got a lot of folks consider, uh, who are going into OBGYN yeah. who uh, want to spend time in cytology and see pap smears, yeah. right? And that's, oh my gosh, I love that, right? And I'm not, I'm not here, like, we can't... Not every single med student can go can into pathology. Right. Like, pathology, right? It doesn't, yeah, sure. doesn't work. Um, right? Like, thank goodness for my OBGYNs because yeah. they send, send us material yeah. so I can have yeah. the job that I love. Um, but I think starting that communication early, right? So that's an opportunity to spend time with a cytopathologist, hear how they're thinking. Yeah. You know, then we have a relationship down the road. You've got a weird pap, call me and send it to me yeah. and I'll tell you what I think, right? Um, so I agree with you. I think it's a great rotation for anybody. Um, there's different things to learn depending on what you're, what you're focused on. What you're on. going for. And after reading those thousands of applications, say you're the first or second year or maybe third year medical student that's decided, you know, pathology is for me. I definitely want to do pathology 100%. How can I be the best applicant? How can I be mm. the most competitive, the applicant that you're going to read and say, you know what, I got to have Zach. Zach the, because Zach did XYZ and he did this kind of thing and the way he's kind of writing his essay, we got to have him. Are there any things that students should think about as they're going through medical school to make the director or someone who's going to pick if you're in their program say, we got to have this girl or this guy? Yeah. So um, there's a couple of things that we're going to look at, that we look at every single application yeah. for. Um, it's like secret sauce here, yeah. right? So if you're, it's great to have. Yeah. <laughs> if you're interested in pathology, yeah. number one, you need to have done at least one pathology rotation. Yeah. Um, I and, and like, it's silly to say, yeah. but uh, that's number one. Because yeah. um, you need to know what it is you're, yeah. you know, Gonna going do. for, right? Um, and two is better. So one is good, two is better. Um, important for you to have done some research as loosely defined as possible if it can be with a pathologist, even better. And like, we have to do research. So mm -hmm. we're psyched to have folks work with us. Yeah. Um, if it, you know, is a poster or a presentation, even better. But even just anything with a pathologist, thumbs up. There's a pathology interest group. Mm -hmm. Be a member of it. If you can be leadership of it, even better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will say this is um, not necessarily pathology specific, but I think medicine specific is we need to improve our efforts in terms of diversity and inclusion. 
um, and in terms of reaching out to underserved communities. So I think efforts in those ways that are real are also absolutely noted and appreciated um, because we think it's important if you're going to be part of our community to care about those things. Yeah. Um, and, and our medical community, yes, yes, not just course, the pathology yeah. <laughs> community, right? Um, obviously, it's good to have done well in medical school, Um you know, I, I think if you didn't do great in your physical exam class, that matters a lot less than if you didn't do great in histology. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> this makes sense, yeah. Um, and I will say, so one other really important thing actually is who your letter writers are and how well they know you. When your letter writer is a program director and says, I know Zach so well from these three things and I am hoping to get Zach in my own program— that matters a lot. Mm. Versus if somebody says, yeah, Zach was in my class once and he seemed okay. <laughs> that does not do as much for you. <laughs> so, you know, I think it behooves you to reach out to the folks in whatever, I can't imagine this is unique to pathology yeah. either. Reach out to the folks in whatever field. Um, make sure they know you for you and all the the good things about you. Um, and, and, write a personal letter. And does their name and pedigree have any role in the letter or not really? Uh, so interesting, right? Pathology is a small world. Yeah. So if it's like, there are plenty of folks that yeah. at this point I know and trust. Yeah. yeah. So um, that, I don't want to say it matters more. It's not Got like it. you get a plus one if it's from a, it's like uh, somebody who's given yeah. us good yeah. people before, but it's noticed. Yes, I um, it, And especially because it's a small field. I would say any program director of a residency or folk, somebody who's involved in the medical education yeah. um, is going to, you know... Make a little... Yeah, yeah a little, a little check plus gotcha, maybe. Gotcha. But not... I don't care where they what institution they're at. Yeah. I don't care if they're an assistant professor yeah. or an associate professor. I see. Most of all, I care that they know you and they know what a pathologist does yeah. and they think you'll be a good pathologist. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. And are there any red flags? Are there anything you've seen on an application you're like, oh, this person was so good, but no, we can't even think about them because of this? Basic red flags... Um, ethical violations yeah. is is one that comes... You know, I'm all for second chances. Yeah. Um, so I'd want to dig deeper no on one. that, yeah. know, know the details. Um, felonies. Mm -hmm. um, again, some are absolute no's. Yes. Maybe there are some that I would consider, again, because mm -hmm. we're up for second chances. Yep. Um, but in general, felonies are not, not ideal. It. Don't commit a felony in med school. Got right. it. <laughs> um, or if it is, make it a minor one yeah. where no one was injured. Well, maybe just don't commit a felony. Oh, right, right. That's, that's a very good bar to have. Um, trying to think what else. You know, uh, don't be rude yeah. to our program coordinator. She is a phenomenal human being and trying so hard to do a very difficult job. You know, in general, don't yeah. be rude is a good idea. No, this is... Um, you know, I think for the interview day, if you're not interested, act interested. Or, or if you're the type who has like that resting face that looks disinterested, know that about yourself and, change, and, and, yeah. and practice or at least say something like, people often see this as disinterest, but no, I'm really... This is my interest. Face. Right. <laughs> you, you just say it, right? Yeah. We're on Zoom. It's so hard. Yeah. Um, we have received thank you notes for the, the wrong program. That's not a red flag, but, but let's still do that. Kind of yeah, it's it's yeah. like a what did you mean here kind yeah. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, right, if everything else is great about the person, yeah. whatever, moving on. But um, it's not going to help. Just don't you. do it. Right, it's yeah. not going to help you. It's not, gonna not a good you. idea. It's not going to help you. Um, and I will say also, um, right, you're going to interact with our residents. Yeah. Treat them with respect. Yeah. Uh, that is a red flag. Yeah. You are rude to our residents. No go. Yeah. No go. Because yeah. we're building a community, yeah. right? And if you're going to be a in team. our right. Right. Yeah. If you're going to be in our community, part of that is is being kind to each other. Yeah. So let's step away from getting in, and let's say we're in, and now you've been in a, you've been attending for five years. You said mm -hmm. finishing up. Where do you, this is a top, very tough question, uh, but but where do you think the future of pathology is? And this can be this can be everything from you know I think we're going to get such good scanners that we don't actually have to look at the microscope. You think that's never going to happen? I don't know about never. Okay. I am very confident that it will not happen in my career lifetime. Got it. Got it. Okay. Right, because we've been at this since 
pretty much my entire life, yeah. we've been trying to make, you know, computers be yeah. pathologists and we're nowhere, nowhere nice. close. Nice. So if it's taken 40 odd years to get nowhere yeah. close, I think in 40 odd years, we still won't be there. Got so, it, got it. So you're <laughs> safe. Are I safe. feel like I'm good. Yeah. Um, you know, I think... Uh, AI obviously is already adding yeah. to pathology and will continue yeah. to. It is phenomenal for needle in a haystack mm -hmm. jobs, um, right? Looking for one cell in 10,000, awesome. I'm yeah. so psyched to have a computer do that instead of me. <laughs> yeah. um, good also, we know that, you know, estimating how many nuclei in this field are positive is something that human eyeballs are only okay at. Mm -hmm. The computers are very good. So in times when it matters yeah. to use the computer to help, great. I yeah. love it. Um, so those are areas, and we already use it for pap smears, uh, not at Jefferson, but at very high volume places, we'll use it to say, what are the 20 fields that are the most likely to have a problem? So I can look at those 20 fields, and if they don't, I can say, okay, this yeah. is negative, right? Those are sort of computer-based jobs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that changing drastically. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on more general. I think I I get a good idea of what pathology is. I think I have a good idea of why some why you made this transition and what kind of a life of a pathologist is. But now, as a doctor in general, going through kind of your career change and everything, do you have any general recommendations or guidance or advice to for it could be directed to me, it could be directed to anyone because I'm about to start this career right in three short months I'll be a quote-unquote doctor, treating quote-unquote real patients and things like that. In terms of choosing a career, yeah. the first thing is don't look at what you want your life to be like in five years. Got you it. have to look longer down the road. Um, and that can be hard, right? I mean, I know Allison at 22 was not Allison at 32. Mm -hmm. Her priorities were very different, but I'm still the same person, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think be honest with yourself. What what makes you happy now? And how can you make your life in 10, 20 years reflect that as opposed to focusing on the training time, right? Because training is, is transitory, you know, it will be longer or shorter depending on what you do, but that's like a defined moment and there is a lot of life afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I think step one is to sort of long game, think about who you are now <laughs> and reflect that for the long game. Um, if I can say picking a par the right life partner makes a huge, huge difference. I mean, if you want a life partner, mm -hmm. but if you're going to have a life partner, picking the right one, one who truly supports you for who you are and who you are excited to support is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I feel very lucky in that regard. Um, and, you know, I think as How do you know that? It's a very tough question. But how, oh. Mm. How, how do you know they're going to be that person? That's gonna, <sighs> well, you Do you, you run know, them through a test? You know, uh -huh. <laughs> I can't, wait, so I mean, I, I, I guess sort of ran my husband yeah. through a test by switching careers on him <laughs> while he was trying to get his PhD and we had twins. Um, and he passed. Oh, I mean, With flying, flying colors. colors. Right. You know, I think, how did I know that early on, right? This, um, we liked doing, we liked and like doing similar things. That uh, helps because when you have very little extra time yeah. to do, you know, that that's helpful, not necessary, but helpful. He was excited to hear mm. about the things that excited me. I was excited to hear about the things that excited him. I wanted to help him move forward and, you know, in terms of getting his PhD. When I told him I was thinking about surgery, he wasn't like, oh, no, I'm never going to see my wife. He was like, that's so cool. Like, tell me more, you know. Um, I think, you know, really listening to those conversations, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I feel like early on, it's it's possible to tell if somebody is genuinely interested. Mm. Um, that's that's, that's a, nice. it's a good sign. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's a, I thought, yeah, that is a good sign. I don't recommend switching careers while they're working on a PhD as the litmus test. As the test, and no. you know, throw some babies in there <laughs> right, just to, right. just to, to, just to make to, sure they can do it. Up the heat. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't recommend that. Um, and but, but in terms of of medicine, I think really embracing lifelong learning will be a benefit in any medical field, yeah. right? Whatever it is, we're all pushing boundaries. Um, we all want to increase the medical knowledge and to to embrace that, to make make it part of your daily life will only, you know, serve you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really helpful. But books, are there any books in any way, shape, or form that you think medical students or people in the healthcare field should read? And they don't have to read it, but maybe you'd give it to a gift to them and say, this is kind of a cool book to check out. So, um... 
I mean, I think all the folks who write medical stuff for The New Yorker are excellent, yeah. right? It's Hul Gawande, Groupman, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name, who wrote The Emperor of Maladies. Oh, so I think I have that. That's um, right there. Um, it's, it's right there on the left, very left side yeah. on the top left. Yeah. Um, uh, I can't even read that. I'm yeah, so Mu- blind. Mukherjee. Mukherjee. Yeah. Mukherjee. I mean, so all spectacular. Yeah. Um, the first book that actually came to mind, and this is maybe unique for me, um, but right, so my chemist father, uh, when I was in middle school, did a lot of work working on um, treatment for HIV, right? This was like early 90s, so still very infancy mm. in terms of actually treating it. Um, and he gave, kind of weird, gave to his you know 12-year-old daughter and the band played on. Which okay. I don't know if you've read it. I have not read okay, it. Okay, so I'm recommending it to you, I guess, also. <laughs> it's so it's it's written by a journalist okay. about the start of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and I mean it's really a critique, right? And the band played on, mean like business was usual. Mm. Like there was a catastrophe happening and we didn't intervene. Mm. Um, so I think You were twelve when he gave this to you? Yeah, mm-hmm. this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Or, right, he trusted me, yeah. and, and this was very meaningful yeah. to him and wanted to share that with me. I mean, it's it's a gut-wrenching story. You know, spoiler alert, the, the journalist ends up dying of AIDS, wow. of course. Um, but I think it's a hugely important story of the way medical, the medical profession and, honestly, government can make a difference yeah. or can stand aside and, and let things happen. Mm. And, you know, I want to be on the side that's working towards yeah. making a difference. So what are some characteristics of physicians? So I mean, you encountered many physicians going out through training. Are there any characteristics or any things about them where you that you admire? Like, listen, Dr. XYZ does this in an amazing way. These are the things, these are the kind of person, the kind of doctor I want to be. Um, am I supposed to call out specific you folks here? You don't have here? to, you can. Okay. Because we're complimenting them, so you can say okay. you can do whatever you want. So I think... Um, being curious uh-huh. is number one for me, right? Be- especially because I think of medicine very much as not a, um, like the book of medicine is not written yet, right? Like there's oodles of blank pages yeah. at the age, so if, at the end. So if you're not curious, you'll never find out what's actually written on those blank yeah. pages, right? So curiosity, I think, is number one. Um, I think somebody who is completely comfortable admitting when they don't know something, but coupled with the desire to learn that something Mm -hmm. is inspirational to me, right? It makes it okay that I don't, well, you know, if if Dr. Taluk, who's like the goddess of pathology, if she occasionally has to look things up, then I guess it's reasonable (laughs) that I too have to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So I I think I find that inspirational. Mm -hmm. The folks who, because I know everybody does it, right? So the folks who will do that in public and admit Mm. to that, right? Like, for, for pathology, we didn't touch on this, but uh, to continue being certified, I have to take multiple choice questions every quarter and get at least 60% of every them. Every quarter? Co- correct. That's is different than other specialties, correct. right? Correct. It's, it's wonderful. So yeah. we used to have... You, it's wonderful. <laughs> the quality of the t- version of you. I was going <laughs> to... I think it's great for, t- for two reasons. Yeah. So it used to be every 10 years, you had to go back down to Tampa and mm. get recertified. I'd much rather take 15 multiple choice questions every quarter. Order, then is go it a high to stress t- situation? Or These fifteen multiple yeah, choice. No, no okay. so I, I you only have to get I forget how many of them. It's I I almost always get all of them right. Like they're yeah. super fair questions. I should know the answer to them, but importantly, it's open book. Yeah, oh. you have five minutes per question mm-hmm. to use any resource you want, mm. except another human being. Mm. So I think it's fantastic, yeah. right? It's like admitting that of course it's not all in your brain. You just need to know where to find it. So I I don't know, I find that very inspirational. Um, And then in terms of other sort of leadership physicians, uh, the folks who raise others up with them, obviously those are the people you want to work with. Um, Right, I was very lucky, lucky, uh, Dr. Chan, who's the program director for pathology, very quickly when I came on faculty, she said, I'd like you to be our APD, um, which was sort of scary at the time, but she is wonderful at saying this great thing that happened, 95% of the efforts were Allison's. Yeah. And that makes you want to work hard yeah. for people, right? When you get credit for your work. No, um, it's, it's huge. It's huge. And being exposed, say I'm, a, I'm, I'm the top of the class pathologist, like every place wants me. How do you 
like scout out programs and decide, you know, this is a because you've throughout this discussion, I've learned how important it is to have a good team, people that are going to build you up and help you learn and help you grow. How do you see that as an interviewing med- fourth year Oof. medical student? How do you kind of scout that out? Are there any ways you can best kind of suss this? So I would definitely encourage interviewees to ask um, when they get to interact with residents, why did you pick this place and would you pick it again? Mm. I think those are really important questions. Mm-hmm. I will say when I interview, I love when candidates ask me what um, characteristics will let someone succeed in your program. Mm-hmm. Um, that will at least, you know, if if they say to you, someone who has drive among, you know, above anything else mm-hmm. or, or something like that, that's important information mm-hmm. to have. Yeah. If they say to you, someone who can work well with others, that's also important, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think that could be a telling yeah. question. You know, it's hard because it's hard. in an interview, people are going to only tell you so part. much, right? Yeah. You know, I think it's also reasonable to say, what do the residents do together, right? Yeah. And if the answer is, uh, that's frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in times of COVID, it's yeah. a little challenging. But now people are hanging out together, I think. I think. So. Yeah, we're I recording hope this. So. When is it? March. Right. Yeah. Right. We're in person. Yeah. I brought a mask, yes. but I'm not wearing yes. it. Yes. Um, I guess that that could be another way to ask. You know, I think a telling thing about our program is how many residents stay when asked, right? Um, I am far from the only faculty member who did my training here. Mm-hmm. It says a lot yeah. when you make the choice to continue to on around. in your department. So you could say, do residents stay for fellowship? Do fellows stay on faculty that tells you something. I yeah. don't know if it tells you yeah. collegiality, no, it's but it's it's it's, it's a plus. It's I helpful. think if the answer is no, never, that is a red flag. <laughs> Everyone leaves as soon as they've done. They get the hell out of here as soon as possible. No, that's really helpful. Do you have any closing words towards medical students that are considering pathology? I think you're on the right track yeah. if you're considering pathology. <laughs> yeah. No, very realistically, yeah. if you uh, enjoy. Thinking, yeah. asking questions, working things through as yeah. opposed to memorizing things. Yeah. If you enjoy a team atmosphere, come and spend some time with us and see how it feels. Um, yeah. Right, Because if you don't search us out, unfortunately, you probably won't get the exposure. So it's it's the onus is on you. Um but we would love to have you, yeah. right? We would love to give you the opportunity to see how it feels. Yeah, yeah. To spend time with us. And... Final question. Any closing words in general? This can be, again, about lifestyle. This can be about books. This can be about relationships. This can be about your career in medicine. It can be anything whatsoever. To any medical student who's listening, right? Like, who you are is good enough. You belong here. And so figure out what aspect of life here is going to make you happiest, Mm. right? Like think down the road, not five years from now, but longer term. What do you love now? And what do you hope to still have then? Whatever it is, there's a place for that in medicine. And if you try one thing and it's not the right thing, that's okay. Continue to reach out, talk to people, right? Everyone in the medical field, we want to help the medical students succeed and become the next generation in the medical field. So Find a grown-up you can trust, start a conversation, and and you'll find the place where you belong. Perfect. Great way to end. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thank you so much.